Hello, everyone. We'll be starting in just a moment. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. My name is Tobias Eigen, and I am community builder for the Global Legal Empowerment Network. I'm located near Seattle on the west coast of the United States. I will be facilitating today's webinar. It's Thursday, May 12th, and today we've come together to hear about ground truthing from Kanchi Kohli of the CPR Namati team in New Delhi. Questions will be handled by our moderators, Kritika Dinesh, also in New Delhi, and Michael Otto from the network team in New York. Before we get too far into today's proceedings, I have some brief housekeeping. First, I'd like you to take note that this event is being recorded, and we will share the full recording and highlights later on our website. I also want to make sure you can hear well and are able to use our webinar system. You'll see a questions pane where you can type in your questions and communicate with the moderator team and the button for raising your hand. You can select, also select a button to toggle between full screen and window viewer, which is very handy. So why don't you go ahead and raise your hand right now to let us know that you're able to um, hear me and also to confirm that you're able to raise your hand. Great. I'm seeing some hands going up. McKinley and uh, Minakshi, uh, Nicholas, Priti, Rachel. Satna, Surya, Tafadzwa, Vivek, wonderful, wonderful. Um, so great to see all of you here, and so great to see so many of you raising your hands. There are many who are not raising your hands yet, though, so um, if you could raise your hand, please. Just take another moment. Of Gino, so great to see all these names that I recognize from the registration um, and corresponding ahead of the webinar. Amy, Ananya, Bharat, Daniel. Great. Well, I think we have a pretty good um, list of people who've been able to raise their hands. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and uh, lower your hand now, and I'm going to ask you another question. Um, can you please um, uh, use the questions box to tell us where you are coming from? And we'll take a moment um, to um, let everyone type in where they're coming from. Great. Chiang Mai, Thailand, Mumbai, Canada, D.C., Lamu, Kenya. Oh, I love Lamu. I used to live in Kenya, so I used to go to Lamu on a regular basis. One of my favorite places in the world. India, Delhi, uh, WRI in D.C., Fatih from Delhi, D.C., Mablu in India, Lincoln, Nebraska, live with Kanchi. There's a group of people together with uh, Kanchi right now, um, who's going to be presenting in a moment. New York, Sierra Leone, Bangalore, Bangalore, Singapore, Belgium, South Africa, London. Great, great. Well, thank you all so much um, who've written your, um, where you're coming from in the, in the questions panel. So it looks like we're ready to get started. Uh, many of you are not already members of the Global Le Legal Empowerment Network, so um, you may be learning about us for the first time right now. 
Um, so what is the Global Legal Empowerment Network? We are a growing community of now more than 600 organizations and 3,000 individuals working to advance justice around the world. We are lawyers and community paralegals, human rights activists and grassroots organizers, health advocates and educators, researchers, journalists and public servants. We work in local communities and we collaborate and learn from one another across regions and across disciplines. How do we do this? We connect to the internet <laughs> um, using a mobile and email friendly discussion platform where we discuss problems and share solutions and opportunities with one another. We also learn from one another in person at webinars like this one and in face-to-face -face learning exchanges, leadership courses and other events. We share legal empowerment resources in our online library, which today has more than 800 free training materials. Monitoring and evaluation tools, case management forms, academic research, and more. Last but not least, um, we join together to campaign on issues that affect us globally and nationally, such as the Sustainable Development Goals. So how can you join the network? Well, it's free and open to all. Um, you just have to complete a sign-up form on our website, then you're in. I will be getting in touch with all of you after the webinar to invite you to join the network website via the network website. Um, and I'd be happy to hear from each and every one of you to answer your questions and help you set up your accounts and start participating in community activities. So um, now um, I'm pleased at last to introduce Kanchi Kohli. She will be speaking for 25 minutes and with breaks to check that everyone is still following. Please add your questions as we move along in the questions pane. Kritika and Michael will collect uh, your questions and make sure that we answer each and every one of them to the very best of our abilities. There will be time after the presentation for more questions and also to give the floor to participants. So let us know via the questions pane if you'd like to be unmuted and the question or topic you'd like to talk about. Kanchi Kohli works on environment, forest, and biodiversity governance in India and their interface with trade and industrialization. Her work seeks to draw empirical evidence from sites of conflict and locates it within the legal and policy processes. Kanchi's work emphasizes the need for both research and advocacy as essential to highlight aspects of regulatory design and how it influences ultimate outcomes related to livelihood and ecological security. She has individually and in teams authored several publications, papers, and popular articles. And now she is about to speak to you all. <laughs> Kanchi, over to you. Thank you, Tobias. Uh, uh, am I audible? Is everybody able to hear me? Uh, would you, to Tobias, are you able to hear me? I can hear you very well. And um, I see people are raising their hands to let you know. Um, that they can hear you. That's great. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for joining in uh, into this webinar and I think up front I'd like to acknowledge that while I'm the speaker here, much of this work is collective. Uh, the thinking behind this is you know, not just the, the EJ team which is working with Center for Policy Research in Namati but uh, all the people we work with who are part of the ground truthing efforts who helped actually build this methodology with us. So uh, yeah, without their backing, this this uh, this presentation would be nothing. Uh, to uh, take the to, to take the presentation forward, uh, I just like to highlight that uh, we will be trying to break out break up this uh, uh, you know uh, presentation in five parts. Uh, I'll try and lay out the background and context and speak about uh, you know the context of conditional improvals and regulatory safeguards, which are really Central to a central piece to the uh, compliance work that we do and uh, the ground truthing work that we've been doing and we've been building towards, and then get into what is what is uh, ground truthing according to our experience and the methodology, uh, an example of a community-led ground truthing effort, and then finally end with certain challenges because uh, actually uh, you know uh, while how, how much ever exciting it may sound, this this really when it plays out on on the ground. The ground truthing when it plays out on the ground is quite a challenge. Uh, so I'll just lay out the background and context. And the background and context is also that 
why is it that the environment justice program uh, this collaborative environment justice program really tried to work in already transformed landscapes uh, and with the focus on compliance you know most cases many many countries have really old old projects of uh, uh, you know 30 40 50 years old whether it's mining projects or power power stations or industries which are uh, where, where people are living around and uh, these are these are considered to be impossible or, or lost causes and uh, we also felt during our, our work that you know these might not be as charismatic as challenging new consensus of, and approvals and it's not this is not to say that that piece of work is not important but it is not it might not be as charismatic as challenging new consensus and approvals but it's an important area of work and it's an important area of work where the ground truthing methodology really works well uh, whereas the methodology can be used in other contexts, the ground truthing methodology has has fairly worked well in in these instances. Uh, this we are often we are often uh, you know the responses we also get as part of the uh, the work is that this is the work done after the fact. So it's 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 a work. It's really you are entering the scene after the industry has come up or after the mining operation has started. You know it's it's really what's the point. Uh, coming in at that at, at that point of time and that's that's the area of work there, there are uh, questions also raised about you know okay if you are accepting this sort of development are you being co-opted and uh, in many ways what this this work is trying to respond to is the challenge of compliance and how is it that you know ground level evidence can inform better environmental decision making in other places and as well as the, the same place where the, the ground truthing methodology is being used. So in you know it, it operates in a space where the you know uh, powerless, vulnerable and hopeless citizens meet corporates and uh, governments which are often saturated by power and habituated to being above the law. So you are starting at a, at, in, a, in, a, in a place of conflict. What are the manifestations in, in scenarios like this? Uh, we are talking about large scale land conversions, water contamination and depletion, loss of habitats and species, impacts on local livelihoods uh, and health. And these are areas, as I mentioned, are areas of open conflict where, where the conflict on environment versus development uh, really plays up strongly. And often in, in many of these places, there is a breakdown of rule of law. Many of you who joined in this webinar probably are aware of these situations. I'll just uh, go through a bunch of photographs which kind of uh, which kind of visualize these manifestations. For instance, these, there are rapid transformations and restrictions of access. So the first picture is of a place which was earlier a, a, you know, a grazing ground for, for, for camels and camel herders. Uh, there, is, there are instances where uh, non-compliance and uh, has, has led to choking of rivers and degradation of forests. Uh, Toxic ash dikes, uh, dust impacts. In fact, this is a picture of a place where the community actually said, "You know, the the air is so bad and the water is so bad that we can't, we can neither cook nor make tea." So uh, it, it it really played out very strongly uh, what what the level of impact was. It's also talking about risky living, right? Right next to mine overburdens. Uh, seen, this is a picture from India, but I'm sure these are, these are scenes which are, uh, you know, which, which you can see in different parts of the world as well. Uh, water contamination, a very clear, out, you know, output of many uh, instances of non-compliance, whether it's power stations, you know, industries, or, or, or mining operations. And finally, often uh, local communities with, uh, you know, involved in nature-based livelihoods are squeezed out by neighborly expansion. So the power plant just behind this fishing harbor is just, is just inching away in, in squeezing out uh, existing homes and livelihoods in these spaces. Before I move on to the next section on conditional approvals, uh, I just wanted to uh, just flag if, and then you know, just pause here and just uh, check with everybody if it's been okay so far, if you could just raise your hand and let me know. And, also use this opportunity if you have any questions or criticisms or, or uh, responses to anything that I've said so far. Uh, could we take about five Great. seconds to do that, please? Yes, go ahead. I'm going to lower everybody's hand. Uh, I hadn't done that before. So why don't you go ahead and raise your hands, everyone, um, just to confirm that you're still following along. Thank you, um, Amy, Aditya, Anika. Yashri, Daljit, Damandeep, Denise, 
Elizabeth, Gino, Hadi, uh, Hadi Jem. Great. Um, so everybody can hear you fine. Uh, please also take a moment to um, um, add your questions um, to the questions pane. And uh, we're gathering them um, to be addressed at the end. That's great. All right. Actually, uh, well, the names are all alphabetical, so I'm naming all the people early. <laughs> Loveline, Malcolm Kamara. So nice to see our colleagues in Sierra Leone also participating today. And actually, Mustafa, this really is a global event. Okay. All right, go ahead. Why don't you carry on, Kanchi? So, so, yeah, moving on, I mean, it's not like governments and, uh, you know, institutions that administration or courts haven't really put out uh, systems to address these conflicts. Uh, there are instances, there are laws, environmental laws, other land-related laws in different countries which lay out procedures through which there would be, each of these operations would need to go through a procedure of regulatory decision-making and the, you know, result in conditional uh, approvals and a set of regulatory safeguards which need to be followed. Uh, and most countries, uh, if you just map out the, the, the kinds of uh, regulatory uh, protocols that need to be followed or legal systems that need to be followed, there are systems, good or bad, related to impact assessments and public hearings, conservation and management of forests, specifically on wildlife, land acquisition and rights, and pollution control and management. And each of these approvals, licenses, permissions for any of these operations often, more often than not, result in a set of conditions or safeguards that are, are given to an operator. Uh, they, these might not be strong enough, but they, they do exist. Uh, just a few examples of the kinds of, uh, uh, you know, conditions that are laid out. For instance, this one is from an environmental approval in India, which talks about, uh, for instance, fishermen vessels of local communities are just not to be interfered with. Uh, another one from Kenya, which with the help of our partners, Natural Justice, uh, we, we got access to some of these uh, condition letters, basically says that all conditions, all conditions, if not complied with, would be in contravention with a particular legislation. And with that means it attracts provisions of that legislation for penalties and often revocation of those approvals. What this means is if you don't really comply with all the conditions and safeguards or any of the conditions and safeguards laid out as part of your approvals, uh, action could be taken or uh, licenses could be revoked. But it also means is that if these are actually complied with, many of the problems and the scenarios that showed out in those pictures might not actually exist. So uh, th that's where we actually enter in. Uh, the, the other kind of um, um, a condition that we have in front of us is basically related to coal transportation. Uh, Transportation of coal has to follow certain guidelines, protocols, which more often than not don't uh, does not happen. So either they need to be uh, there are very clearly laid out conditions whether that they need to be uh, you know transportation needs to be by roll by rail or a conveyor belt, or it needs to be done through uh, you know covered trucks following very clear time uh, time specifications on when when uh, the transportation takes place. So these are the range of conditions that are actually laid out. If complied with, uh, often problems of, um, on, of livelihood impact, of environmental impacts, do not arise. So uh, is, is it, uh, I, I'll just pause here again for about five minutes, or five seconds rather, uh, and just uh, get everybody's hands up again, if you can tell me whether this is okay. And of course, any questions of, uh, in terms of what I said, in terms specifically, uh, you know, whether such safeguards are do exist in various exist in various countries, to what extent? Great. I'm seeing many hands raised, and Great. Um, we have 73 registrants in in attendance today, uh, which is quite exciting. Um, go ahead and take a moment everyone to reflect on what Kenshi has already said and uh, ask your questions. Take a moment to ask your questions in the questions pane. Fantastic. Okay. okay. Go ahead. 
I'm going to lower everyone's hands again. Go ahead, Kanchi. Okay. So to the crux of what, uh, what, what, we, what the subject of this webinar is, what is ground truthing? In many ways, it's as simple as being on the ground. Uh, what is there in the, you know, what is there in papers, what's there in satellite imagery, what is, how, how does it actually play out on the ground? Uh, it also means bringing the distant government closer. So many, many instances, while the government is supposed to monitor the compliance of safeguards and conditions uh, of, of licenses, they are very far away from where the impacts are actually playing out. So in many ways, it is, it is about, through this exercise, being on the ground and bringing the distant government closer to see, smell, hear, and really sense the truth of the ground. Uh, because all these impacts are actually have man very strong manifestations which you can see, smell, hear, and actually sense and feel. And governments far away from these places are just not able to do that and are lost in paperwork. Uh, so ground truthing, very simply, is corroborating legal requirements stated in official documents with very clear observable facts at, at the site. And I am emphasizing observable facts because the, met, the method actually emphasizes on how local communities without necessarily scientific technology or expert knowledge can corroborate what is there in the documents in to, in, very clearly in relation to what is there on the ground. So uh, the, uh, the license letter might say that this pipeline should not pass through this route and it is there. Uh, or for that matter, you should not dump muck in that forest that I showed you the picture of, and but it is being dumped there, uh, and as a result of which it's having livelihood and ecological impacts. Uh, ground truthing also talks about creating evidence through physical verification, uh, using maps, photographs, and official documents, which are easily accessible, uh, or or rather, uh, you push to get get out through this method. Uh, might not be always easily accessible, but you try and use these these tools to actually create create the evidence. Uh, it's always directed to a regulatory authority or an appellate mechanism, mechanism or a judiciary. It is talking about long term responses and activating these systems uh, so that it's it's not just a direct negotiation between. The, the, the company that is impacting and the affected communities but or is, is directing long-term change through a regulatory system or, or an appellate mechanism. It could be a one-time investigation or an on, or ongoing mon monitoring. So you could actually do, that, do it go in, do, a, do a, a ground truthing right there or do it on a regular basis uh, in, in, an, in an operation uh, with, and, you know, in, a, in a place. It can be used at a, as uh, used at pre-approval pre, pre evidence building or post-approval monitoring. What I mainly uh, is, I'm trying to talk about here is that sometimes, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, even prior to, uh, prior to a project really coming up, or a mine or an industry really coming up in, in an area, this methodology can be used. But we have effectively tried to use it in the post-approval phase, and primarily because this is a methodology least used uh, in that phase. Most, mostly it results in either protest or litigation. So you're trying to use the uh, ground truthing methodology to, to uh, you know, invoke ad administrative remedies uh, through a very sound uh, evidence building uh, mechanism. Uh, what do you need for ground truthing? Uh, working knowledge of laws and regulatory practice, that is a must because whatever you collect is directed, is, is linked to a legal book and it's also linked to a regulatory practice. Uh, it, it is very clearly linked to the fact that there needs to be availability of official approval letters, agreements, and licenses related to a certain operation. It's all because this is talking about corroborating it on the ground and also uh, observable facts. Access to site, to the site, specific site of impact, or at least the surroundings is critical. Uh, it also links, it's not enough to know the, the laws or, or, or regulations, it also links to the fact that you need to have the knowledge of the range of institutions where this evidence could be directed. So it's not enough to actually link that uh, the EIA process is being violated, but where does the remedy actually lie? Which institution can you really take this to closest to the site of conflict? It also emphasizes on minimum three sources of evidence to rule out chance, probabilities, 
Uh, often in court matters, this is, this is, this is a critical thing. But in, in the ground truthing method, we talk about at least minimum three sources of evidence to actually triangulate the, the claim. Uh, ground truthing could be at different scales. It could be done by individual or small teams, uh, either environmental or rights-based organizations, along with key informants in the, in the uh, you know, in, in a community. So for the, you, you can actually use the letter uh, and the facts on the ground and, and just file complaints. It could be through a more of a community-led process, which I'll, will, which I'll talk about uh, subsequently, through a bunch of community representatives along with external legal education and empowerment actors, researchers, lawyers, environmental organizations. Or ground truthing can be a very critical, critical uh, component as a methodological step in uh, the legal empowerment approach, which the EJ CPR Namati Environment Justice Program is trying to use in its applied research and legal empowerment program in India and now uh, you know, trying to share it across the world as well. So it's, it's an essential step in the, in the community paralegal approach as well. Uh, a five minute, no, a five second pause uh, to say if it's going okay for everybody, uh, please type in your questions and do get us, give us uh, your response. Yeah, go ahead and raise your hands everyone just to uh, show a sign of life and that you're able to hear fine. Great, we're getting a lot of hands coming up. Wonderful, wonderful. Take just a few seconds to compose a question or two and add it in the question pane. And um, I'm gonna lower your hands again and uh, please add your questions to the question pane if you have a question, um, the hand raising, we're only using it at the moment to uh, show a sign of life. Later on, we'll, uh, we'll use it for other things. But for right now, it's just uh, to make sure that people are able to hear. Okay, I'm going to lower your hands. Uh, go ahead, Kanchi, carry on. This is going very well. Yeah. So uh, as fourth, for the fourth segment of this, uh, this uh, presentation is basically a particular case where a community-led ground truthing effort uh, which was a collaborative effort between Center for Policy Research, Namati, a couple of local organizations, and a local community-based organization in the western part of India. It basically involved six steps. Starting off, it meant that uh, researchers, legal not, not legal practitioners, people who, researchers who use law, local organizations, uh, community-based organizations, as well as uh, representatives from the community, affected community, actually sat down together to understand the approval process. What does it take to, uh, you know, for, for say a port in an area to come up? And w what has been the process so far? Has it see received a license? And if it's received the license, what are the, what are the licenses uh, uh, and, and the safeguard conditions that have been laid out? Uh, so understanding the approval process was the first step. Uh, through that approval process, identifying the mandatory conditions or safeguards that need to be followed by this operation and not following which would have resulted in the impacts. For, for instance, uh, a condition of non-destruction of mangroves or for that, uh, the condition that I showed you earlier in terms of not uh, you know, restricting access of, uh, for fishing or non-destruction of sand dunes, etc. Um, so that was a you know, the understanding the approval process, identifying the mandatory conditions and safeguards was the second step. The third is the process of actually collecting evidence and mapping out, uh, you know, whether it's through satellite imagery or participatory mapping, actually do uh, evidence collection for this process. Subsequent to this, it's not enough in a community-led ground truthing process to, uh, to actually link the evidence to a law or a legal violation. It's a, a critical component of this process is to discuss the remedies that need to be sought. So for instance, are you actually looking at closing down the operations? Or are you looking for just remedial measures? Are those remedial measures actually possible? That discussion becomes a very important part of the ground truthing process. What is the remedies being sought? And subsequent to that is the drafting the ground truthing report. So it could mean people contributing uh, different parts of it, somebody actually takes responsibility of putting together the evidence, writing it up, uh, somebody else doing the maps. So that process of drafting the ground truthing report 
is the next step, including the remedies that you're being that they, that you're asking for. And finally, uh, because understanding, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, the institutional link was critical earlier, submitting the report to an appropriate agency. These were the six steps that were followed in the uh, community-led ground footing process. These are just some pictures in terms of how it really played out. Uh, so, sitting uh, sitting out together uh, and looking at the map of a special economic zone and how it is it shows up on a Google Earth imagery, or sitting down together and mapping out where uh, in, you know just at a beach uh, what's really happening. I think many of you will be very familiar with doing these things with other uh, other kinds of work as well. This is basically the kind of evidence that was created uh, for one particular community-led ground truthing effort that I'm talking about. The picture on top is satellite imagery of the year 2000, which talks about the the uh, the red is all mangroves, the uh, the brown is all mud flats, and by the end of it, by the by the end of 2011, after the port etc. has come up, you actually see all of it destroyed. Now the Port authorities could actually say that this is fine. Once you construct a port, it's, it's all fine. We, we, we expect this destruction. However, in this particular approval process and safeguards, it was very clear that mangroves do not need to be destroyed and fishing access needs to continue, both of which actually had been stopped because of this land use change that took place. And this was part of the ground truthing effort. This was corroborated along with pictures of mangrove, mangrove destructions uh, blockage of access, like the kind of picture that I showed you in the very beginning, where there's there's a car trying to go through uh, through a walled uh, in a walled area. So this is the kind of evidence that this process really uh, tried to create. And subsequent to this process, uh, in the same area, CPR and Namati have together tried to build this methodology in to a community parallel process where if you can see the second part of, of, this, uh, of this case form that is used, uh, the action by the paralegal in this legal empowerment approach talks about evidence building and dossier creation and which is the, the ground truthing method is central to this process uh, uh, you know, which, is, which has taken place subsequently. Uh, five seconds, please show us your hands, any more questions before we end with the challenges. Okay, I'm seeing some hands coming up. 25 hands are up, so people are able to hear you um, just fine. Um, go ahead, everyone, and add your questions to the question pane. And we're reaching the end of the presentation now, so soon you'll have an opportunity to hear the answers to your questions. So go ahead and, and uh, take a moment to compose a question or two. Thanks so much. Okay, I'm going to lower your hands. Uh, Kanchi, carry on, please. So it's all not not very sweet and happy. Even if you know, all, not all problems can be solved with ground truthing. There are there are areas and, and friends and partners internationally have told us that it's not so simple. Maybe in countries like India, uh, you can assume that certain documents are available. It's not the case everywhere. Even here, not all agencies are cooperative. There are a whole bunch of challenges of actually really using the method of ground truthing and which which is which is true but this this is our, our our innovation is in terms of how do you actually overcome some of these challenges the first is are the restrictions on access to information the very information that you're relying on license letters agreements um, safeguard information laws that is not easily available there are no public tools through which you can access these information, so it's like right to information laws or access to government agencies. There are, there are those real restrictions that do, which, which do exist. Uh, even if this information is available or is made available through a process of negotiation and dialogue, these do not actually include adequate safeguards or license conditions. So even in, in the places that we work, we often might actually get access to these documents, but the conditions are not strong enough that you can actually ground through which of course is an important step in the, the moment you are, you are not able to ground truth or you can find evidence in terms of non-compliance becomes an important process through which you go back to the government and say unless and until the conditions and safeguards are 
are strong enough, you're not even going to be able to address the impacts that are played out. Uh, creating legally admissible evidence requires creativity. It's not always easy to actually get those three, at least three sets of information together. Uh, it, it, there is the, the, the kinds of cases that we've been involved in, whether it is tracking a pipeline or actually, uh, you know, just going and talking to people, all kinds of, or, 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 you know, taking the help of another government department to actually uh, back up the claim requires a lot of creativity in terms of creating that evidence uh, which is observable and linking up to the document itself. There are places where there are clear conflicts with government. There's a trust breakdown. And uh, very often, uh, affected communities are also no, would not be interested in talking to governments, and governments might not be interested in talking to communities. But then the fact is, how do you actually address some of these these gaps and make these processes, uh, you know, in in, in uh, processes where where this uh, where I mentioned uh, earlier that you know you actually bring the government close to the place, you actually go bring them to the ground. It's it's far, pretty far away and sitting smug somewhere. Uh, the the final thing is here that the remedy sub, you know, substantially also hinges on institutional response. You can actually build this evidence, you can build a relationship, but it hinges on an institutional response. And if the government, and the institutions and the government agencies don't respond, then it often, the conflict you know, might not be resolved or you might not get the adequate remedy. Uh, our experience has been that consistently going back to the government, speaking to the government, giving very solid uh, grounded evidence pushes the response, but this might not happen everywhere, and this, is, this remains a challenge. Uh, justice finally could be a really long way off, but uh, methods like ground truthing could could be one way of, you know, walking with us while we are taking going towards that long way off. Uh, the two websites below will give you far more information on uh, on, on this methodology. Very soon, we'll try and upload a, a note on this methodology and also try and share it with uh, all of you. Thank you for listening, and we are happy to take your questions. That's great. Thank you so much, um, Kanchi. Why don't you just leave, leave your screen where it is? Um, and uh, I think it's a, it's a kind of a sobering image. <laughs> um, thank you so much for your great presentation. Um, I wonder. Um, where to begin? Let's see. So um, we had um, many questions, and um, one of them I um, I can respond to, which is uh, whether the presentation will be openly available after the webinar, asked by um, Anika. And um, the answer to that is yes. Um, we're recording the webinar now, and we're going to be posting it um, on our website. And uh, um, so yes, yeah, so the answer to that is yes. So as soon as uh, the webinar ends. Um, I'll put the webinar recording up and I'll email out to everyone the link, um, everyone who registered. Um, Krithika, um, would you like to take the floor to uh, address some of these questions um, and uh, to, to uh, communicate them to Kanchi so she can answer them? Yeah, thank you, to Tobias. Uh, the mm -hmm. first question is from Daljeet Singh. He asked how to ensure that the agency doing the ground truthing is seen as objective and unbiased. How important is that? Uh, this is definitely very, 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 very critical in, in especially areas where uh, there is there is a trust breakdown, where affected communities are, are don't also see an eye to eye. Uh, there, there is also uh, litigation that is uh, that is just you know opportunistic litigation that takes place. However, there are methods by which uh, you could you could ensure that the ground truthing uh, you know is is objective, especially if it's a group that comes together and it's it's very clearly laid out up front what we are trying to trying to do through this process. We are not trying to take get short term uh, you know short term kind of remedies or responses. We are looking at a long haul. We are looking at a long we are looking at long term remedies uh, through this process. I, I I definitely agree that this is this is an important uh, important thing to take care of and uh, uh, but you know one of the things that we that we try and do in this as I mentioned was uh, the, the the evidence collection definitely talks about at least three pieces of evidence and that triangulation method ensures that 
this is not just uh, an impulsive uh, sort of response to something that is happening. It is it is very clearly building uh, that that evidence. And a lot of people who are not interested in that long, uh, you know, long and detailed process might not even continue. So you, if you're looking for that, that's that's one way we've tried to uh, address in some of the cases. Where and we've had cases where people who are not interested in going through with it have just said, okay, uh, we won't. Thank you, Kanchi. The next question is from Matthew John. He says, ground truthing seems a method to get a measure of real costs. What if the costs are just too high? Do you have examples where projects have been closed by a ground truthing exercise? Certainly not big ticket projects. Uh, we've still not had that, uh, you know, that, that kind of experience. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, the, the community led ground truthing process, uh, the slides that I showed you of the example actually resulted in the government condoning the violations after accepting all of them. Uh, because it was not prudent to shut down a very, uh, you know, an activity. However, there are instances where smaller projects are experienced, especially through the uh, CPR Namati EJ uh, case level work, whether it's whether it's sand mining or industrial pollution, plugging a pipeline. Those kinds of things have definitely succeeded. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Mansi Verma. She says, these environmental clearances, while the documents may be available in public, there may not be enough awareness among the affected people for them to be able to bring up these issues in absence of ground truthing exercise undertaken by a third party. Does ground truthing bring out such gaps also, and how can these be overcome? Yeah, so I think as I, as I mentioned, this, in the six step process, the first step is really understanding the legal process and understanding which are the institutions responsible for monitoring. So it is pretty much in the heart of uh, the ground truthing process that uh, the legal awareness uh, of, of both the laws and the regulatory processes and where the remedy actually lies is pretty much part of it. So that's why we're talking about linking it to legal empowerment. Uh, it's not enough to just solve the problem. It's also be, it's important to be legally aware so that you can help other people solve the problem. The next question is from Elizabeth Moses. Can you speak of the impact of lack of political will around the enforcement or compliance? She's also interested in connecting national ministry regular, regulatory authority versus local office. And how can we prioritize which regular, regulatory authority to target? Uh, political will is, uh, I'm not sure ground truthing can solve it. Uh, it can definitely appeal to political will when you're able to show uh, strong evidence of impacts on livelihoods uh, and people who are affected themselves and who are part of the you know the the voter base of the political constituency uh, you know actually bring it to that person it might impact political will but it's definitely not uh, it is only one piece of the the big puzzle uh, the you know the connecting the national ministry regulatory authority versus local office in almost all our cases we try try and start local at the office closest to the site of impact. And only if you are not able to uh, get a response there, then it goes uh, to what we, in India, of course, it's state level, but it could be a province level. Uh, at the national level, the least amount of, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, the, the processes actually approach the least amount of, the least amount of instances where, which, are, uh, which are taken to the national level, uh, unless, uh, especially in the legal empowerment program. The next question is from Nakul Hebley. My question is about the scale, but on the side of the project is being studied. So the question is, how effective can ground truthing be in monitoring small scale industries and their levels of compliance? Uh, there are many, many cases that we have as part of the legal empowerment and applied research program, which are really small scale. Uh, they could be small scale in an industrial area where there, where, uh, uh, you know, legal safeguards and compliances apply to the entire industrial area, or it could be small scale uh, at the community level. Often, uh, where there have been instances like uh, uh, instances like really unregulated sectors like sand mining or quarrying, where there is local participation uh, in that uh, in that activity, 
it gets it it gets difficult to do ground truthing uh, because one of the bases of this ground truthing process is that there needs to be uh, a need felt for it uh, from from the affected community. We we don't just uh, especially as part of the community led effort and the and the um, uh, legal empowerment process. We don't we don't try and do go anywhere where there is there is not a community or a, a part of the community that is affect uh, that that is affected and wants a remedy. However, ground truthing can be a very effective tool, even as a, as I mentioned, at the scale. If you're an individual along with key informers want to go and do it, it's very possible. Uh, because almost every uh, process requires some bit of license. It might not be in an environmental law. It could be a mines and geology law. It could be somewhere else. There's definitely some paper that the person needs to have to start operations. The next question is from Arpit Street. Srivastav, don't you think that the regulatory or impact assessment process is tedious in nature, owing to which setups try to avoid such a process and do pollute the environment? Do suggest some measures. Uh, I thought ground truthing it could be one measure, but uh, but I, I agree with you. It's long, tedious. It hinges a lot on the law actually really working for the people. That's a really a bigger, larger problem. Um, which I think pieces of work like this are really trying to address. It is like really trying to, uh, you know, appeal to regulatory authorities that you need to in in include things like third-party monitoring of uh, affected communities to make it far more effective and not long and tedious. The next question is from Sihari Dukipati. Um, his question is: Where there aren't adequate protections, can ground truthing exercise help? He also has another question. When the clearance is conditional, such as in coal transport, is it more challenging to ensure enforcement? And also one more question. How is authenticity of evidence connected, established in absence of official data? Uh, where there aren't enough adequate protections to recognize so I think this is what it what what the ground truthing is trying to tell you is that if you're as I mentioned if this remains a challenge the, the the way the the condition of the safeguard is framed really helps a lot in doing the ground truthing process if it's vague if it's many conditions into one it often does not help that much however what you could really point out is that we could not do ground truthing uh, we could not do monitoring well because it's vaguely drafted because it's not strong enough. And that becomes an important policy input to go back and say that you need to really uh, ensure better safeguard, better frame safeguards uh, so that they could be, ground truthing can be done uh, by affected people or anybody else who's interested. What is the other one? And the clearance is conditions such as in the coal transport. Is it more challenging? It is definitely, but you know, there are, for instance, one of, one of the one of our main cases in, in the state of Gujarat is where we're working is of the coal handling guidelines and I think Bharat Patel is on this call and he's been, he's the one who brought this uh, to the team and which is where they very clearly set out guidelines for coal transportation both in terms of uh, coal handling in, in a particular area in an industry or a port and as well as transportation and how, uh, you know, so basically it is, it is definitely challenging but if there is that legal empowerment and legal awareness throughout the the you know the, the route where the transportation is taking place it's a it's a big goal but it's it's uh, it's difficult but not impossible and the third one authenticity of evidence so yeah that's where so authenticity of where official data is not available uh, it as i mentioned that is definitely a challenge but the, you uh, but you often get some piece piece of paper uh, Either through a through a you know uh, it might not be an environmental uh, uh, lease agreement etc. It could be a memorandum of understanding or something like that that uh, that that helps. If that is not available at all, then photographs, maps, uh, you know testimonies they could become an important piece uh, to say we are we are bringing this so that you could actually share that uh, official data with us or corroborate it with that official data. That's one way to do it. The next question is from Divya Narain. Have there been any cases where the ground truthing process has been followed by bringing the corporate or the investors on board? So uh, it, uh, it, 
so far there have been uh, there have been uh, no specific instances where the ground truthing effort has really brought the corporate or the investors on board that has also been an important strategic decisions because we are talking about pooling together all these instances where the ground truthing and evidence and problem solving really takes place to appeal to a better regulatory system so that this is not a one off response uh, uh, appealing to the sensibilities of a good or a bad corporate but are, is is affecting change and affecting a strong uh, you know legal compliance and monitoring mechanism in a place the next question is from nayana uday shankar when the remedies or actions to be taken are discussed who is it discussed with the whole affected community or the paralegals how would you handle differences in opinion when the about what action would be best suited yeah so as i as i mentioned this is definitely not a uh, uh, an exercise where uh, where all people in a community are coming together and there is there is agreement there is a there is it's a clear understanding from uh, from the very beginning that it is uh, it could be paralegals along with a section of the affected people who are, are seeking remedy or uh, seeking a certain kind of remedy precautions are taken that a remedy that is being sought does not actually result in an impact on the another part of the community so for instance in an, in an, in a particular area where there is the fishing uh, fishing community affected by uh, salt operations it should not the remedy should not necessarily result in getting all the lab, laborers working on the salt farms out so that is very clearly discussed as part of these processes it does not necessarily mean that everybody who does not see eye to eye in the community is sitting together and coming to a conclusion but precautions are definitely taken the next question is from surya sethi ground truthing is based on the premise that the institutional framework that is supposed to protect the local environment and social impacts is either failed or is non existent her question is has ground truthing ever shown that all efforts were made to improve and protect the local environment and stakeholders uh so it actually doesn't really it doesn't really necessarily uh, assume that uh, you know it has it's failed or not non existent it could just be that that distance uh, in terms of uh, you know the, the distance of the regulatory agency and the affected people has not really been been bridged and uh, you know what is the other part has the ground truth ever shown that all efforts were made to improve the process and to protect, protect the local environment i think in many of our cases where ground truthing is part of one of the uh, legal empowerment uh, uh, one of the components of the legal empowerment process is almost all cases the, the efforts are showing that it, the efforts have been made uh, the very fact that the regulatory agency is responding more often efforts have been made to improve and protect the local environment so i think in many ways it's activating a a, a system that might be a lot of people assume is not non existent but it does exist it just needs to be brought closer The next question is from Sahil Shashidharan. How does the impact between locals? How does it impact the locals, and does it lead to conflicts? Also, does oral evidence get included in this framework of ground truthing, since the end result is a legal and administrative process? Uh, oral evidence is definitely uh, not one of the most substantial pieces of evidence that are that is used in this process. Uh, so it is mostly uh, uh it's mostly uh you know it's mostly what you put it's mostly documented evidence and and all of that is that is legally admissible in a in a court system um what is the other part of the question it does lead to conflicts i mean for instance i, I there are there are instances where there could be local interests in a particular operation it it does lead to conflicts both for paralegals and for uh, Or, or or set or the part of the community that is raising the i mean it's without 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 saying it does need to go should we pause now or should we continue with the questions uh would you like to gather more questions or how would... we have so many questions uh <laughs> and my what i would like to propose is um that um let's see so um we will 
um, definitely address all the questions um, after the webinar concludes, um, and we'll post them on um, our discussion platform. And so we and we'll link to them from the um, email that we'll, we'll send out to you. And um, I also would like to propose that if if uh, um, if you'd be amenable, that uh, perhaps I could wrap up the formal part of the webinar now, and then we can. Um, continue to address some more. We can also give the floor to um, some participants. Um, what do you guys think, uh, Kanshi and Kritika? Is that a good idea? Can we that do it that great. way? That would be great. Good. All right, so let me um, go ahead and um, wrap up the formal part of the webinar, um, which will allow uh, those of you to leave who need to, uh, to move along. Um, and, and um, and continue your day, <laughs> go home from the office or start your day depending on where you are in the world. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for joining us and uh, I'm, I'm really impressed by these excellent questions and the points raised. Um, this is really a terrific group of people. Um, I'd like to thank Kritika and Michael for fielding the questions. Um, it's been uh, a little hectic, as Michael said, uh, to try to consolidate all the questions because there's been so many of them, um, which is just terrific. And uh, of course, not least, I'd like to thank you, Kanchi, for your informative presentation. We've learned a lot today about ground truthing, and it's been a, a, a real pleasure to listen to you and to get this important update um, about this important work. Um, so as I said at the start, uh, the Global Legal Empowerment Network is open to all, and membership is free. Please sign up as soon as you can so we can start learning from you and introduce you to our community for sharing and collaboration. It would be wonderful to extend the wonderful sharing that's happening here in this webinar um, into other uh, network activities, a discussion platform, resource library. Um, if you are already a member and you haven't logged in for a while, please take this opportunity to rejoin us and let us know what you're working on, the challenges you're facing, and potential op opportunities you know about uh, for collaborating with uh, fellow practitioners in the network. Um, and uh, as I said before, I'll be in touch by email with a reminder invitation and also to share the link uh, to the full recording of today's proceedings. Um, so let's keep the conversation going. Um, so um, on that note, I, I you know give permission to everyone who needs to take off um, uh, to do so, um, and those that want to stay on uh, to discuss um, a bit longer, um, uh, let's go ahead and do that. Um, so, uh, Kritika, let me turn the floor back over to you, and maybe you can let me know if there's anyone in particular that you'd like to offer the floor, um, or if we should, how you'd like to proceed um, with the questions. We could maybe unmute one of the attendees and let them ask the question. I think Nakul Heble wanted to speak. Great. So let me find let me find Nakul Heble here. Um, Nakul Heble, you're now unmuted. You have the floor. Nakul, can you hear us? We're not hearing you. Or if there's anybody else, they can raise their hand and ask the question. Hi, Kashi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I go ahead. Hear. Yeah, uh, so my question was on uh, legal admissibility. Um, so this is, uh, so you, you start with the position that uh, uh, the state is uh, either unable or uh, uh, willing but doesn't have uh, enough resources to um, do monitoring at the most basic level. Um, but uh, there might be instances where uh, uh, you go ahead, do the ground truthing, collect three at least, uh, three evidence uh, for triangulation, uh, while at the same time uh, the regulator uh, involved in this process uh, does uh, their part of uh, monitoring as well. And uh, have you uh, uh, come across any uh, instances where uh, the evidence you collected and the evidence that the uh, monitoring or the uh, enforcement agency uh, collected has differed? And uh, has that made a difference to the project? Yeah, I think the 
one of the when we did this study on monitoring and compliance back in 2009 the difference in terms of ground level evidence and of uh, sometimes what is said in in government monitoring reports does come up often in the government monitoring reports there is there is instances of non compliance recorded whereas on the ground you actually see uh, uh, that there is there is definitely non compliance in fact sometimes the government document says as per the project authorities a compliance report monitoring is uh, compliance is taking place so that's the monitoring report it it, has, it hasn't really gone uh, you know corroborated the facts uh, on the ground so that difference does arise but very often the difference also does not arise because one piece of evidence that uh, that 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 the uh, uh, you know people involved in ground truthing use is often an older show cause notice uh, issued by the same authority to go back to the regulatory authority to say you've issued a show cause notice we are adding on two or three other pieces of evidence to add on to uh, uh, to let you know that the the non compliance is is is, uh, is continuing so it's not enough to take uh, just issue a show cause notice and uh, agree with the response that you receive however steps need to be taken to really remedy the situation otherwise for 20 years the fish in the kolak river will continue to die okay, okay. thank you so much thank you kanchi i think next surya sethi wanted to say something yeah so if you can hear me yes i yes we can hear you yeah kanchi i think the point i was trying to make when i asked you the question was that inherently i see this whole thing to be further source of conflict because the very idea of ground truthing Uh, is to go and find out whether uh, what the regulatory agencies are reporting is right or not right or whether they are doing their job or not doing their job or even if as you say the regulatory agencies are not able to actually reach out to the ground level uh, like you might be able to do or the people doing the ground truthing might be able to do so my uh, the point i was trying to make is that rather than making this a situation of conflict can you turn it around and say that look uh, will will the regulatory agencies even allow you to turn it around to say that look we are here to help you uh, to see whether uh, the the project conditions are being met or not being met and uh, collect evidence on your behalf then you take away the conflict and you you take on a supportive role and then maybe there'll be greater success in uh, and actually making a difference on the ground level because then you are essentially uh, extending their ability to 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 monitor and enforce uh, yeah see i think the the process that we are actually undertaking is exactly to address the problem that you are that you are uh, that you are raising that most often than not it has been adversarial you actually either take yeah. on the project or you take on the government that they are not performing Uh, the idea is to appeal to the regulatory functions to say we are doing our part uh, if you could also come closer and do do your part can we actually together uh, affect compliance and ensure there are there, there are safeguards there in fact in many of the cases where uh, the ground truthing has been part of the paralegal approach this has been uh, the, the partnership has been very central uh, has been a very central piece of the whole process uh, yeah. and and uh, it, it's not our part and their part it is it is the same part you know uh, ultimately the the idea is the same and the regulatory agency and institution was created to to protect the environment protect the stakeholders you know do the right things so if if ground truthing no, takes on a view that look we are simply trying to help you do your job better and then maybe this adversarial uh, issues fall away <clears throat> i don't know i'm just asking because i find it uh, uh, you know from actual experience i can tell you that there's always there'll always be tension uh, you know you can give it a view that this is a third party independent ass- independent assessment uh, but there will always be that kind of tension there 
but it's just it just could be a productive tension so that we could actually have yeah. effective part of uh, this monitoring yeah. process and it yeah. becomes far more collaborative from both sides that, that's okay, I think um, I'd like to um, go on to another questioner there are many people that have questions um, so we can um, uh, go ahead and do that um, let's see um, Sanjeet, uh, would you like to um, have the floor? Hello. Sanjeet, I've unmuted you. Yeah. I, I have, a, I have a, just a small question regarding this. Uh, uh, the ma'am told that there are three source of, sources of evidence. They should, they should be there in the ground truthing. So what could be probably these three sources which we could uh, like ascertain while taking on the field work or uh, um, and also, uh, I'll also add up that while uh, considering the conditions of the environmental clearance in India, there there are a lot of uh, uh, there are a lot of conditions related to the transportation of coal. But uh, uh, since we have filed a lot of uh, uh, litigation before the Green Tribunal, um, most of the conditions regarding this uh, transportation of coal were not being followed. So how to how to uh, insert some like a strictness in these conditions that at least this uh, the the transportation of coal and handling should be very much effectively handled by the project proponent so in order to lessen the pollution so at least these uh, basic uh, basic things uh, do not come into our way uh, and do not pollute aggregate aggravate the situation to the environment yeah, yeah there are two parts to to your question first is about what could those three pieces of evidence be? Uh, in our experience, uh, what we've tried to do is get uh, very clear photographs, uh, maps. Uh, very often, we also find there has been some sort of show cause notice or the other that has been issued. There could be a media report that has that has that there has been an, there has been a, a pipeline leak or a, you know impact of access or anything like that. There could be something like that. There could be a complaint that has been filed by an affected community that could actually corroborate the photograph and the and the map that that yeah. that those are the kinds of uh, pieces of evidence that we've we've tried to uh, create over a period of time to actually yeah. go back to the regulatory authority and say that this is uh, this is part of the uh, process of monitoring uh, okay. the other part of uh, of coal transportation this is actually in many of the cases that we've been uh, we've been trying to uh, you know, do research on and also trying to resolve uh, through the administrative route. Uh, in, uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of our colleagues actually uh, has used very effectively the coal handling guidelines of Gujarat. And in fact, uh, even though there are guidelines, there is, because this guideline actually has been uh, a flagship guideline of the government, they are very keen in actually, uh, you know, ensuring compliance of it. Similar guidelines, in fact, stronger such guidelines along with the uh, approval process if they exist they become very important um, uh, you know uh, important partners in, in, in ensuring compliance so i mean yes. as as in fact for us this is one of one of our important policy asks that we, yes. how can we actually, I, 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 just perform, but for other other instances also uh, gets similar in knowing very well that there could be challenges in even uh, you know implementing those guidelines i i just want to add one more line into this uh, that is how to how to uh, tackle the situation where the project proponent while preparing the environment impact assessment report the EI report has stated false baseline monitoring data and uh, the, 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 the the data which has been collected by the proponent has been has been stated haphazardly in the EI report so how do we corroborate that because since uh, we are talking about ground uh, ground reality ground truthing then we need to get these data also analyzed from some other agency so if that as an agency does not uh, conquer with our views or how to get these data has been analyzed by by ourselves using it for for the litigation see again it's as i said this this process is talking about very clear observable facts not talking about uh, getting an expert agency to back up the claim uh, it's about uh, it's about also pushing the idea that uh, people in an area are not enemies of the project or enemies of the government they could be very willing participants in ensuring uh, important safeguards uh, uh, 
if if a, if a process if a, if a project needs to come up in an area or or for a, for that matter the EIA has to be strengthened in its baseline you could be very important participants in that process however as i to, to, as i clearly mentioned we we feel that this process is far more effective in a, in an area where it's, which is already uh, transformed where, where there are clear uh, conditions that need to be uh, that need to be corroborated the EI uh, EI related uh, the, you know uh, facts can be also uh, corroborated using uh, using uh, the ground truthing method uh, which which we we have tried in one or two instances but not so much our, our, our emphasis has been on the space of post post approval compliance thank you thank, thank you so you much Kanji. thank you so much I think next, uh, Lawrence had a question or a comment. Great, I'm going to unmute you, Lawrence. Um, can you uh, can you speak? Yeah. yeah, can you hear Go me? Ahead. Yes, we can. Go ahead. Oh, okay, thank you. First of all, thank you so much for the presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, I think I have a quick question regarding the piece of evidence collected. Um, besides maps and pictures, are you using uh, video as evidence uh, taken by first responder uh, on the ground in the process? And if yes, what kind of challenges do you find, um, uh, what kind of challenges do you have in their admissibility uh, in court or in the process, the legal process? Video is definitely used in a few cases, but where we can actually use photographs, uh, it's been far more. Uh, uh, I think it's been for people. It's been faster to just get that uh, just printed and and submitted as evidence. Video has, in, in one or two instances, in fact, uh, we faced problems in uh, in terms of uh, the people part of the ground truthing effort have actually trespassed in a place and taken a video and tried to submit that as, as an evidence. So uh, we've, we've actually called back that piece of evidence to say we cannot use it because it means you're showing that you're also doing an illegal act. So uh, there have been challenges in using the video, both, both technologically as well as, uh, as well as how do you actually get good quality videos. But that is not to say that it could not necessarily be an important uh, part of that triangulation. OK. OK, thank you very thank much. You. I think we'll take one last question. Um, there is Rose. Uh, Tobias, can you unmute Rose? Certainly, in just one moment. Okay, Rose, I've unmuted you. Did you want to ask your question? I know you've had your, your hand raised uh, for most of the presentation, so I, I hope uh, you're able to speak. Go ahead. Rose, are you there? Looks like we've we've lost Rose. Are you are you there? You've, you're unmuted. So the um, the question that you had asked in the questions pane is, um, you know, for countries, how how have you maneuvered situations where the license does not have a condition of an issue specified in an environmental management plan? Um, Kanchi, why don't you go ahead and uh, try to answer that question? Can you actually Sorry. corroborate the environment management plan, not the license? The environment management plan is an equally binding legal legal document which you could which you could ground truth, and not necessarily the environmental clearance condition, the license condition. This is not only linked to the uh, this process is not linked only to corroborating what is there as a safeguard in the license condition, but if, if the Environment management plan, which is a legal document, says it could be done, and it's not being done. That could, that could be part of this uh, uh, this ground truthing effort. That could be corroborated. The evidence could be collected. Thank you, Kanchi. I think we can respond to the rest of the questions uh, through email. Yes, great. Um, I um, unfortunately uh, we can never have enough time to um, uh, 
um, give everyone the floor who would like to have it. Um, and um, I do very much appreciate um, all the thoughtful questions and um, also for everyone who um, stayed on uh, to the bitter end and um, um, uh, enjoying this very interesting uh, discussion. Um, as uh, Kritika just said, we are going to um, seek to um, address all the questions that we receive and we will follow up um, directly with some of you um, as, as relevant and um, um, I personally am also going to be writing to everyone to invite you to join the network and um, we will um, um, we will also um, be posting questions um, to the discussion platform um, so that uh, and their answers um, so we can perhaps dig a little bit deeper into some of these um, into some of these issues surrounding ground truthing so um, I'd like to thank everyone, um, Kritika and uh, Kanchi and uh, everyone sitting there together. Maybe I'd like to give you guys the, the last word and then um, we will um, wrap up this webinar. So thank you ahead. and hope to see you all in ground routing mode uh, more in sometime in the future. Thank you, Tobias. You're very welcome. Thank you, thank you all so much. Thanks All right. Um, good, goodbye, everyone, and uh, look forward to seeing you at a future webinar.